I would like uh, first to welcome our keynote speaker, who's Doug Ollenbock. I think most of you would uh, know Doug from his work on innate immunity for a long time, going from cytokines to toll-like receptors, and uh, thereafter also more also to pathology-oriented, to malaria work. And we are very happy to, to have you here today, and uh, well, we are looking forward to your talk. I'm going to talk to you today about work that I've done in collaboration with Eike Lotz and uh, Michael Henneke, who's at the University of Bonn, and unfortunately couldn't make it today, on Alzheimer's disease. And, and with, uh, with that, I'll just start by introducing you to Al, I can never say his name right, Alois? Is there a Frenchman in the audience? Al, how? Alois. 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 Alzheimer. And this is he right here. And he was, <coughs> he was uh, actually uh, quite taken aback when he met this patient, a 51-year-old uh, woman who had, for the unexplained reasons, she was losing her memory. And he followed her until she died five years later of this incapacitating dementia. And then he took her brain back to uh, um, Emil Kreplin's laboratory in Munich and dissected it and with some apparently Italian colleagues made two uh, very important observations. The first was that he discovered that this brain was filled with amyloid protein. And the second was that there were neurofibrillary tangles that seemed to, to somehow shouldn't have been there. And these were, as we know, tangles of phosphatau protein. And what happened later was that Kreplin published uh, a textbook, and he called it Alzheimer's disease. And that's how the name Alzheimer's disease came about. So this is a neurodegenerative disease, and it's caused by widespread cell death. And that can be seen here in this cartoon of a normal brain next to <coughs> what um, would be an Alzheimer's brain, and you can see all this loss of cortical material, in particular in the hippocampus, where lots of different types of new memories um, are formed. And this, uh, this shrinkage of the cerebral cortex can be seen at autopsy. Uh, when we compare this normal brain to an Alzheimer's brain, you see these, uh, these massive sulci that you could, you could literally stick a finger into. There's been so much cortical loss. So the field has, for a long time, centered around the observation that beta amyloid, uh, which is a peptide fragment of amyloid precursor protein, is pro-inflammatory. And that's led to something called the amyloid hypothesis, which in some respects apparently is uh, controversial because the amount of amyloid deposition doesn't really correlate too well with the disease, but it does appear that beta amyloid is involved in the disease. Now, the, the, some of the strongest pieces of evidence are that there are patients who have abnormalities in this amyloid cascade that results in the formation of amyloid plaques who have Alzheimer's disease. For example, there are patients, there are families who have point mutations in amyloid precursor protein, and as a result, they, they pass along the, uh, the trait in an autosomal dominant uh, fashion to their children, and if you are unlucky enough to get one of these mutations, you're probably going to get Alzheimer's disease. Similarly, there are many mutations in one of the uh, genes involved in uh, processing amyloid precursor protein, gamma secretase or presenolin 1. There are at least 50 mutations that have been identified in presenolin 1 that are involved in autosomal inheritance of Alzheimer's disease. Nevertheless, the, uh, when you combine the amyloid mutations and the presenolin 1 mutations, you're probably talking about less than 5% of the total individuals who develop Alzheimer's disease. So we find it hard to get human volunteers to give us brain samples for amyloid protein. So instead, we purchase uh, the peptide from a company, and we put it into solution where it forms oligomers and uh, ultimately forms uh, fibrils that can be used to study cells in culture. Um, this is, a, uh, this is a, 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 an h and &E section of a brain, and you can see these amyloid plaques. And these plaques in the brain are surrounded by microglial cells. So what are microglial cells? These are almost brain macrophages. When I say almost macrophages, that's because 
even though they resemble macrophages in virtually all respects, they're CD14 positive, they have toll receptors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they release cytokines, uh, and, and so on. They actually come from a different embryonic origin uh, than bone marrow-derived macrophages, and, um, and they have some unique markers of their own. One thing about microglial cells that's very important is that they're responsible for uh, maintaining a sort of amyloid-free brain because they phagocytose and they degrade extra amyloid that's in the brain, and that's a, a very important feature of the disease. So the activation of microglial cells is an essential event in Alzheimer's disease, and it's been known for several decades now that activated microglial cells that are, that are um, stained from the brains of Alzheimer's patients uh, have high amounts of interleukin-1 beta. That's especially true of the microglial cells that surround A beta plaques. They're filled with uh, interleukin-1 beta. And so for many years, it's been thought that IL-1 beta was a key ingredient in the development of the disease. So um, that led Annette Holler, whose picture you're going to see shortly, to do this experiment. She took microglial cells. Now, these are mice, uh, microglial cells from mice that were primed with LPS and added A beta peptide. And you can see that these cells produce an abundant amount of interleukin-1 beta. And so this led Annette to ask the question whether the IL-1 beta being generated during Alzheimer's disease came from activation of an inflammasome complex. And for a variety of reasons, of all the inflammasomes to focus on, uh, Annette focused on uh, NLRP3, which at that time we called NAB3. I think the major reason why she focused on NLRP3 was that everybody else on the, uh, on the floor in the building was working on NLRP3, and so that led her to thinking that maybe NLRP3 was involved in A beta recognition. This is a, a well-known inflammasome to many of you out there. It's involved in the pathogenesis of diverse diseases such as gout, silicosis, um, bacterial infections such as Staph aureus, Listeria monocytogenes, et cetera, and it, more than any other inflammasome we understand, NLRP3. Now, the activation of NLRP3 is a bit complicated. I'm sure you're going to hear plenty about NLRP3 over the course of the next week, so I'm going to do this rather quickly. But we'd like to think of activating this inflammasome as involving two separate and distinct signals. And clearly, they're not really separate and distinct, but nevertheless, that's how we think about it. We call them signal one and signal two. And signal one, shown here schematically, really involves the generation or the activation of NF-kappa B and NF-kappa B uh, gene products such as pro-interleukin-1 beta. Now, mouse macrophages do not, don't actually express NLRP3 at rest, so this signal 1 is also necessary for the generation of NLRP3. And then signal 2 is a complicated signal that involves uh, multiple events. It involves the efflux of calcium. It involves the production of reactive uh, oxygen species, uh, mitochondrial reaction oxygen species, uh, lysosomal damage, which can occur when uh, crystals, in particular, and beta amyloid, in fact, get phagocytosed. And it involves a uh, um, uh, purinergic signal. And all this, they come together, and they result in the assembly of the NLRP3 inflammasome. And I think one way to think of the NLRP3 inflammasome is that it's nucleated by the receptor NLRP3. There are long fibrils of this adapter molecule, ASC, that line up in such a way that they can recruit caspase 1 to the, the exterior portion of the fiber, where, whereupon it becomes activated and processes pro-IL-1 into uh, active interleukin-1 beta. It also produces uh, IL-18 by processing pro-IL-18 into uh, IL-18. IL-18, and IL-18, incidentally, is constitutively expressed in macrophages. So, um, I've gone through that. One uh, very interesting thing about inflammasomes is that when they assemble, they are so big that you can actually see them. So this is a, a confocal image that Eicher Lotz uh, gave me from his collection of confocal images, and these are cells that have been activated with uh, nigerosin. And you can see these inflammasome complexes, these huge complexes. That's because 
ask here is, is, active, is labeled with a fluorescent protein. And you can actually do biochemistry on these. They're so big that you can disrupt the cells and spin them out by differential centrifugation and, and look at them by, uh, by, say, Western blot. So uh, what is the evidence that beta amyloid induces IL-1 via an inflammasome? Well, uh, these, are, these experiments, again, were done by Annette Holler. Um, the first experiment that she did was that she took an inhibitor of caspase-1, in this case the peptide YVAD, and added it, and we see that beta amyloid-induced activation of IL-1-beta is inhibited in a, in a dose-dependent fashion. Uh, secondly, uh, she looked for evidence that caspase-1 was activated by a beta peptide, which she saw here in this western blot where we see the P10 fragment of caspase-1. And third, she took cells from knockout animals, the NLRP3 knockout and the ASK knockout, and compared them to uh, black six wild type mice. And you can see here that A beta nicely activates the production of IL 1 beta from wild type cells, but there's no production at all from the ASK knockout or the NLRP3 knockout. So that seemed uh, reasonably conclusive. And one more important piece of information, um, which puts A beta into the same type of category, I think, as some of the crystal particles, is that. This process was dependent on internalization of A beta by incubating cells with cytochalase and D. She saw uh, inhibition of the NLRP3 response. Now, I mentioned to you at the very beginning of the talk that Alzheimer's is a disease that's characterized by neuronal cell death. And we wanted to see if there was any evidence that this process could actually read, uh, result in cell death. So what Annette did in this experiment was she co-cultured macrophages with, um, with uh, neurons. So everything here that's in green is a neuron. Everything that's in red, stained with an anti-CD11B antibody, uh, is uh, a microglial cell. It's a little hard to see because of the light, unless you're sitting in the front row or standing at the lectern here. But as you can see, um, these cells grow very nicely together. But when you add a beta peptide, the microglial cells are activated and all the neurons are killed. And this, of course, does not happen in the caspase-1 knockout mouse. <clears throat> so that led us to the hypothesis that lack of NLRP3 activity and or blockade of IL-1 beta and IL-18, and we picked those two caspase-1 cleavage products because they seem like the most likely candidates, will protect against neurodegeneration in Alzheimer's disease. So there was um, a problem with this hypothesis. And that was it was fairly difficult to test. And that's because the laboratory uh, uh, animals, the animals that get Alzheimer's disease, are difficult to bring into the lab. Obviously, we're not going to be bringing in elephants or lions, and even animals such as rabbits and uh, subhuman primates and dogs are much more difficult to do experiments on than our favorite animal, the mouse, which for a variety of reasons doesn't really get Alzheimer's disease. So um, people in the field have gotten around this problem by creating transgenic animals. And uh, the one that is most widely used, although by no means is it the only animal model of Alzheimer's disease, is the APP PS1 mouse. So this is a, a mouse in which the expression of human amyloid protein and presenolin 1, or the gamma secretase, uh, is generated um, through a transgene. And that transgene carries two mutations. One, it carries uh, a mutation in amyloid precursor protein that's found in a Swedish family. So this is known as the Swedish mutation. And two, it's, it carries a mutation of uh, gamma secretase. And both of these, if you were to have either of these mutations, you would have, uh, you would have Alzheimer's disease. So these mice uh, generally begin to develop uh, difficulties in spatial memory and other markers of disease between four to six months of age. And at the same time, they develop a widespread evidence of CNS immune activation. So here, for example, uh, is an, an image of um, some microglial cells that have been stained by antibodies to IBA1, which is a, a, a marker that's relatively specific for microglial cells, and an antibody against the adapter protein ASK. 
And here we see in one of those microglial cells in the brain an active inflammasome or a paroptosome or speck as it will, uh, demonstrating that these animals actually do have inflammasome, what appears to be inflammasome activation in the brain. So in order to test the role of NLRP3 in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease, we bred the APPPS1 mouse into the NLRP3, the CAS base 1, and the ASC knockouts. So I'm going to show you some of the data. Most of the data I'm going to show you is from the NLRP3 data, but where we've looked, it's always been identical in the other two knockouts as well. So in, in the first set of experiments, these mice were actually tested at 16 months of age, which is uh, a fairly advanced stage of disease for a mouse. Now the first test we did is one that's actually a little bit foreign to somebody like me who studies uh, immunity, and that's called the Morris water maze. So mice aren't really that smart. This isn't really a maze. But what this is, is this is a tub, and the tub is filled with water, and then there are some um, visual cues for the mouse to look at. And what you do is you drop the mouse in the water. Here you can see that we, we uh, make the water murky so the, the mouse can't see this platform over here. And the mouse gets into the water and then swims its way around until it finds the platform. And once it finds the platform, it stops and sits there because the mouse would prefer to sit than it would uh, to swim. OK, so this is probably not going to show up at all. Is there any way to make the lights any darker? <laughs> That's the wrong direction. So this would be the mouse. Can you see this? Here's the mouse here. And there are three visual markers around the end. And this mouse has been trained for four days. So he's almost at the point where he knows where the, uh, the platform is. And here he is swimming to the platform. And when he gets there, well, I guess he missed it that time. <laughs> and when he gets to the platform, uh, he will stop. And you, what you do is you do this four times a day for eight days. So they, there's a lot of opportunity for the mice to uh, learn where the platform is. And I can see that I've missed, I missed the control mouse. This is the APPPS1 mouse. I ought to read my own slides. So one of the things you can see is that this mouse has no clue where the platform is. Well, we won't show the we won't show the control mouse. It's like uh, the punchlines. It's like when you the, you tell the punchline before you tell the joke. Anyway, so as I said, we do this four times a day for eight days. Mice tend to learn about uh, by day four where the platform is, and pretty much after that point, they go pretty much directly to the platform. So here, the blue line here is the distance the animal swims to the platform in wild type mice. And then the black line here is the NLRP3 knockout. The red here is the APPPS1 mouse or the Alzheimer's mouse. And then green is what happens when you breed this animal into the NLRP3 knockout. So you can see that that is almost uh, complete protection from the type of memory problems that these animals have. And this is one uh, more recently done in Michael Henneke's lab by Michael. Actually, he did the previous one as well. And this is with the ASK knockout. And again, you see here, blue is the wild type. And by day four, they pretty much know where the platform is. Uh, black is the ASK knockout. And uh, red is the APPPS1 mouse. And then green is what happens when you breed the ASK knockout into the APPPS1 mouse. So again, there's almost complete uh, 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 protection of memory loss there. Now, on day nine, you remove the platform, and then that's a very tricky thing, and then you drop the, the mouse into the water and see where he goes. And you can see a wild-type wild mouse would just go into the quadrant where the, where the platform used to be. The APP PS1 mouse, as you saw in that video, just likes to swim around in circles. And then when the mouse is bred into the NLRP3 knockout, it goes directly to the platform. And we have, as I said, identical data for that in the CASPASE1 knockout and the ASC knockout. <clears throat> now this is, a, this is a test that I hesitate to show you because I don't actually understand how they do this test. 
because I'm not a neurophysiologist. But this is called long-term potentiation. And what this is basically is that you take a slice of brain, you put two electrodes into it, and you, you pulse one end and you time what it takes for the impulse to get to the other, to the other electrode. And with multiple pulses, there's rearrangement um, of the neurons so that the impulse goes faster. And that's as much of it that I understand except for one thing here, and that is that when we look at long-term potentiation in the APP PS1 mouse, it's distinctly different from the wild-type mouse. And when the APP PS1 mouse is bred into MLRP3, it clearly has the same result as the wild-type mouse. And I show this to you, um, even though I don't understand how the test is uh, actually done, is because long-term potentiation is thought to be uh, the physiologic process whereby uh, we learn how we gain memory. And this is completely normalized in uh, the knockout animal when it's been bred into this APPPS1 mouse. Now we also find that NLRP3 knockout uh, have less activation of caspase-1 in their brains compared to the APPPS1 mouse. And we find that they make less interleukin-1 beta which is something that you would have predicted. Now, I might point out to you that this is total IL-1 beta, not the processed form of IL-1 beta. So they're making less IL-1 beta, total IL-1 beta. So that leads to the question, why does there seem to be reduced inflammation in the brains of the NLRP3, caspase-1, and ASC knockouts? And our hypothesis was the reduction in inflammasome activity was due to the lack of NLRP, uh, due to the lack of NLRP3 or caspase-1 is due to the, amount, uh, uh, the reduction in the amount of beta amyloid peptide in the brain. And so the first thing that we did to look at this question was to ask what happens to phagocytosis of beta amyloid in the animals that have been bred into inflammasome knockouts. So to, do, to ask this question, we used a, a test that Michael invented where he injects this Congo red derivative uh, called Metoxy XL4. This is actually used clinically to do PET scanning in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And Congo red has a very, very high uh, affinity for A beta peptide, and this Metoxy XL4 is actually fluorescent. So, what Michael does is he injects this into the animals, he waits three hours, then he euthanizes the mice, isolates their microglial cells and then performs fax analysis, keeping in mind that any cell that is fluorescent is fluorescent because it's phagocytosing A beta peptide. And this was the, uh, a representative result of what Michael saw. Here we have the APPPS1 mouse here. You can see there's very little A beta peptide that's been phagocytosed. There's very little fluorescence. It's, it's almost like wild type, although not quite. Um, but when you compare that to the NLRP3 knockout, we see this abundance of phagocytosis of A beta peptide. And that's combined with the fact that certain enzymes that are known to degrade A beta peptide are elevated by, not so much, by a factor of two. So here's a Western blot, for example, of insulin degrading enzyme. And we compare APPS1 and its levels of IDE uh, to the APPS1 mouse that's been bred into the NLRP3 knockout. And you can see, although it's not a huge shift in the amount of uh, insulin degrading enzymes that expressed, it certainly increases, and this is a very reproducible finding. And the result of all of that is that when one looks at the various parts of the brain, there's clearly less A beta deposition in, uh, in here in the hippocampus, the frontal cortex, and the motor cortex of the brain. So hence, the APPPS1 mouse, when developed in the NLRP3 inflammasome components has less caspase-1 activation. It makes less IL-1 beta. It efficiently phagocytosis beta amyloid, and it exhibits increased levels of enzymes that degrade A beta. And this all results in reduced total A beta deposition. OK, so now everything I've shown you so far relates entirely to mice. And so uh, as with all animal models, we're left with this question, does that have anything to do with what's happening in humans? And I can't say that we really know the answer to that, but we're lucky because there are, uh, in the world, there are places that collect brains and freeze them away and make them available 
to scientists when we need them. And Michael Henneke, again, managed to get his hands on brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease. And the controls in these experiments were all patients who died of a neurologic disorder other than Alzheimer's disease. And he did a Western blot looking for activated caspase-1. And you can see that in all cases, there appears to be uh, evidence that caspase-1 has been activated when you compare, uh, uh, compare caspase-1 levels in contro to controls. So it does look like that there's been caspase-1 activation in the brain of humans with Alzheimer's disease, and presumably there's been NLRP3 activation there as well. Now, I mentioned earlier that the obvious candidates for why knocking out NLRP3 uh, would, would uh, result in less disease were interleukin-1 and IL-18. Those are the obvious cytokines that are made by the NLRP3 inflammasome, so we next went to test the IL-1 receptor knockout mouse. And I'm not going to show you the data because they were quite in inconclusive, and it was pretty much um, after we, we did the experiments, we went back and looked at the literature, and there were actually reports that the IL-1 receptor mouse itself has uh, abnormalities in memory. Um, this was somewhat of a surprise to us, but uh, it, it did look to be true. And it probably has to do with something that happens in the terms of development. All right. But I will say that there was a paper that actually was published in 2011 in the Journal of Immunology addressing the possibility that IL-1 beta might be involved in Alzheimer's disease. And I show you this paper here, Blocking IL-1 Signaling Rescues Cognition, Attenuates Tau Pathology and Restores Neuronal Beta-Catenin Pathway Function in an Alzheimer's Disease Model. They used a, a different animal model than we did. Uh, this came out of uh, a group in Southern California. And the data's not bad. I read the paper this morning. And uh, the data's not bad, although it isn't conclusive, and they, um, there were some issues with controls, and that's probably why it was published in the Journal of Immunology instead of, say, the front page of the New York Times. Um, but uh, it did seem to go along with our hypothesis, but it wasn't conclusive. But we also thought it would be worthwhile to look at IL-18. So we bred the IL-18 knockout into the APP PS1 mouse, and this is, this is kind of a weird thing here, was that my postdoc, I kept saying to her, her name's uh, Jenny Zhang, and uh, I'll tell you about Jenny's work in a minute. I kept saying, Jenny, how come we don't have any data on the IL-18 knockout? And she said, well, our, our colony's not big enough yet. And I said, why isn't our colony big enough yet? And she says, I don't know. We keep breeding and we keep breeding and we just don't seem to have enough mice. And then she goes down and she pulls all these little cards that the animal people have in the side of the cages. And she realizes that uh, beginning around two months of age, the APPPS1 mouse, when it's been bred into the IL-18 knockout, starts to die. So here we have uh, um, uh, a graph that shows the wild-type mouse and the IL-18 knockout. They do pretty well over time. But when the APPPS1 mouse is bred into the IL-18 knockout, and this is the homozygous knockout, they start to die. And um, it's, you can see that it's a dose-dependent thing uh, because if you, if you only have one copy, let's see, IL-18 knockout, APP. Um, if you only have one copy of IL-18 missing, you don't do so well, but you do better. And it also turned out that the IL-18 binding protein transgenic that was given to us by Charles DiNarello, those animals died too. So we didn't really understand why they were dying, so Jenny set up this, um, uh, um, these experiments where mice were actually videotaped 24 hours a day. And I'm going to show you this. This is actually not terribly pleasant to watch. So you may, you don't have to watch this. But you can see we have four cages of mice here. This one here is the IL-18 knockout that's been bred into the APP uh, mouse, and the others are, say, this is IL-18 knockout, this is the APPPS1 mouse, and this is wild type. So she always had uh, all four types of mice in the cage together. And is this moving? Yes. So you can see this guy's hungry, and these two are pretty much sleeping, and this one here is shaking, 
and actually undergoes a seizure and dies. And um, we've actually managed to capture this on video for five different APP mice that have been bred into the IL-18 knockout. So we're, we're pretty clear that they're dying of a seizure disorder. We've put our mice on Keppra, and they uh, only for a few months now, but they don't seem to be dying at all. So for some reason, um, the mice are dying of a seizure disorder. Now, some of the APPPS1 IL-18 knockout mice did survive. You can see about 70% of them died, but there was about 30% left. And those animals were recently tested in the Morris water bath. And you can see that IL-18 deficiency did not protect against uh, the memory loss. So uh, again, blue here is the wild type. Red here is the APPPS1 mouse. And this purple line here, which is indistinguishable from APPPS1, is the, uh, the remaining IL-18 knockouts. Um, that have been bred into the APPPS1 mouse. So we don't really know about IL-1, but we can say with some certainty that IL-18, loss of IL-18, is not protecting the mice. So the deficiency of the NLRP3 inflammasome protects against neurologic disease in the APPPS1 mouse. It's unclear if this is due to, due to reduced IL-1 beta signaling, but the protection is clearly not due to reduced levels of IL-18 which may, in fact, be anti-inflammatory in the brain. And that's led us to the question, uh, which we haven't done much to address as of yet, is could there be a neurotoxic role for other caspase-1 cleavage products? Uh, we know that the, are, these exist. There are probably several hundred of these, um, and they've been described in, I think there have been uh, almost 30, uh, what was it I read, 128 papers about caspase-1 cleavage products other than IL-1 and IL-18. So there's a lot of room here for study, perhaps too much room for study. So uh, let me finish then by acknowledging that uh, this was really a, a collaborative project that involves four PIs. Um, really, Ika and Annette started everything going. Uh, Michael did. Uh, Michael is a, a neurologist at Bonn, and he um, did an enormous amount of the work. Um, also, uh, Martin, I don't know how to pronounce this properly, Kortke, uh, he did the long-term potentiation studies that I showed you a little bit uh, earlier. And Jenny uh, has done all the work on IL-18. And she's done some other things that are of some interest. And the rest of the people here are really uh, technical support staff in Michael's lab. So with that, I will uh, conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, please. No. So gamma, interferon gamma is protective in EAE. And so do you phenocopy the IL-18 uh, um, phenotype in uh, interferon gamma knockouts? <laughs> well, we haven't, we haven't done that yet. So uh, I will say it's, it's not a minor decision to try to do one of these experiments. These mice have to be bred, and then everybody knows how long it takes to breed mice. And then you have to sit on them for a year to 18 months before you can actually do your experiments. So um, it's, it's worth considering. I can't promise you I'll do it. Well, what about if you would give, for example, IL-18 in some, in some um, APPPS1 mice, just let's say not wild type, or how do you call it, the, the standard uh, Alzheimer mouse, I, if you would give recombinant yeah, I think that's a very good experiment. We, we haven't done that either, but right now we're trying to finish this up. Um, we're doing RNA-seq on some brain slices, and, um, then we'll prob and we're waiting to see if the anti-seizure medication actually protects them from dying. So. Let me add one yeah. issue with this drug giving in mice, because you have to penetrate it into the brain, yeah. and you have to open up the blood-brain barrier, and that really screws up the model. Yeah. So, okay. that's a, that's so that would be on. difficult. The thought is, though, the thought is, is though, is that um, the blood-brain barrier is probably disrupted in the ones that have advanced disease. Early disease, probably not. We, we did that for, for society and in, in the mice. We, we saw the same different effects of our one beta and an IL-18 on, on obesity and the mice dying a lot, um, eating a lot and becoming obese if they lack IL-18 but not IL-1 beta. And when we gave them IL-18, they seemed to be... Decreasing. Oh, I'm going on it tomorrow. 
<laughs> yes, Bob. Oh, that was great. So this uh, test that you have, the swimming test for the uh, remembrance and memory, uh, you mentioned that at four to six months of age, these mice begin to develop signs of inflammation in the brain and so on. Mm -hmm. So the outcome of this test, to what extent is this dependent on the failure to learn something new versus remembering something that was learned in the past? And, uh, you know... You well, it's a short-term memory test. I mean, you really only test them for seven, for eight days. Right. So um, unless they forgot how to swim, Actually, um, all kidding aside, we, the reason why we show distance to the platform and not time to the platform is because we know that with enough inflammation, these animals can develop motor difficulties. So therefore, they, they might not know where the platform is, or they might know where the platform is, but it might take them a long time to get there. So that's why you do the distance. And otherwise, it's really just a short term. And in humans who have Alzheimer's, both short term and long term memory is compromised? Well, um, my, I'm not a neurologist, but my understanding is that short-term memory goes first, okay? And that patients with, some patients with advanced Alzheimer's disease will tell you, will, will tell you about something that happened when they were a child, but uh, they can't tell you about something that happened an hour ago. Look, you may have touched on this, but is it all about cell death then? So the microglial cells might die, and then their dams kill the neurons. And it's not to do with either one or either thing at all. It's independent of cytokines. Well, there's, so, there, so that, that's a hard thing to say because, I mean, if you look at the, the lesions themselves, there are plenty of microglial cells. Of course, you can have proliferation of microglial cells, and so you would never be able to see the cell death. So one way we have started to look at this is that we have a, an Ask Reporter mouse that we have so that you can actually see an activated inflammasome, so you can you can do histopathologic studies, and you can breed that mouse into both APPPS1 and into caspase 1 so that you can then um, presumably block the cell death pathway. We haven't done it yet, but we're getting towards that. We're breeding towards that. A great result is the increased phagocytosis, isn't it? Because that would be like the clinical goal here in a way, wouldn't it? And, and that could be because the microglia are living longer and they're phagocytosing more effectively. Maybe yes, well, but, but I, you know, the, we're not the first ones to note that activated macrophages or activate, have abnormalities in, in phagocytosis and that by dampening uh, the inflammatory response, um, you enhance phagocytosis. And Charles Serhan, Charlie Serhan has done this with his lipoxins and resolvins and whatever else. He's shown this too. So dampening inflammation uh, and it helps phagocytosis. One last question. Do you get an astrogliosis? You know, because that's a hallmark as well, isn't it? The astrocytes start to proliferate, <laughs> and you get this peculiar scarring, wounding thing, I don't know. So the glia could be dying, and the astrocytes might be over proliferating. Something like that, isn't it? I, I heard a speaker say last week that a perfect question was one that he could answer. So I'd like to call that an imperfect question, because I don't know the answer. You have heard of astrocytes. Yes, I have. <laughs> Uh, recruitment of other cells into the brain, or any monocytes can come in? Well, I, th I think we don't see that, okay? I mean, the answer is yes, we've looked, but I swear that we've qualitative, quantitatively, we can say there hasn't been recruitment. I don't think we can. But I, we've, we've marked, we've looked for um, peripheral monocytes and macrophages. The, so, Microglial cells, so one of the complicated things about this is, is that although macrophages reproduce all the things that we think microglial cells do, um, they're not indistinguishable from one another. So part of the reason why we use the transgenic approach as opposed to injecting things in mouse brains is so that you don't get um, the recruitment of cells that don't belong in the nervous system into the nervous system. But as I just mentioned a second ago, it's known that as the model progresses and the animals develop more inflammation, the blood brain barrier, blood -brain barrier breaks down. So presumably there are more cells at that time. But I'm sorry, I'm not, I can't answer it better than that. Yeah, Frank? Well, have you uh, checked on the autophagy machinery? regarding the difference in phagocytosis that you see, because we know also neurodegenerative disease and uh, protein complexes, we know this plays a major role. And it could be that there are alterations, uh, and actually a direct connection to that place, and the plasma of the, the cytokine. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's a good point. We haven't. Okay, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. And then